Welcome to the Stranger Than Fiction podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Patrick Meekin. I'm the author of the True Spiritual Warfare books, 225th Street and Nightmare in Holmes County. Both books tell terrifying true stories of spiritual warfare and paranormal activity in real-life haunted houses. Both books are published by Crown of Thorns Publishing and are available at Amazon.com. Well, thank you for tuning in tonight, and I'd like to remind you to uh, please subscribe and share and uh, like the video, and feel free to share your comments down below as well. Because we cover a lot of spiritual warfare topics on the program, tonight I thought it would be interesting to take a look at a very well-known haunting in America known as the Amityville Horror. Most people are familiar with the story uh, based on the movies um, where the Lutz family moved into the house in the 1970s, spent 28 days in the house before they uh, fled in terror, left, leaving all their belongings behind. And some people even know about the incident that occurred before that, which a lot of people think is what opened the door to the Amityville Horror and the Amityville Haunting which was the DeFeo family murders. But the story actually goes back much farther than that. The Montecon Indians, who originally lived on that land, believed that that area where the Amityville Horror House was later built was possessed. They buried their enemies there, believing that their enemies were possessed. They buried them there face down. Later, a man from Salem, Massachusetts in the infamous witchcraft trials named John Ketchum was driven from Salem and reportedly moved to the area uh, where the house is located and it is believed that he practiced witchcraft there until he died. It is also believed that his body is buried on the property. And there is also a Ketchum Avenue in the immediate vicinity of 112 Ocean Avenue, which is the address for the infamous house. There are also unconfirmed reports that previous to the DeFeo family buying the house, there was a family who lived there and there's a boathouse behind the house and it is believed that a boy drowned in the boathouse. Nevertheless, in 1965, the house was bought by the DeFeo family. According to Ronnie uh, Jr. or Butch DeFeo, immediately upon moving into the house, strange things began to happen such as footsteps were heard at night, which could not be explained, and strange screams. All things considered, uh, Butch is not a uh, credible person. Uh, When you see how the story plays out, he is not a credible person. He has changed his story multiple times over the years. But you can't help but wonder, with that history, if he was telling the truth about this. By 1973, the family was made up of Ronald DeFeo Sr., age 43, Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr., age 23, Louise DeFeo, age 42, Don DeFeo, age 18, Allison DeFeo, age 13, Mark Gregory DeFeo, age 11, and John Matthew DeFeo, age 9. By the time 1973 rolled around, there was a lot of conflict in the family. Butch, who was the firstborn son, had always been overweight growing up, and his father held him to a very high standard. Ronald Sr. was a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde in that one minute he could be praising Ronnie and giving him a hug, and the next minute throwing him across the room or punching him. He was very violent. And Butch turned to drugs to deal with this. So he used uh, a lot of amphetamines, which did cause him to lose a lot of the extra weight he was carrying. But he began using other hard drugs as well. 
and Ron Sr. was not just violent with Butch. He was also violent with his wife Louise, who was also rumored to be having an affair behind his back as well. The family began to believe that some of their problems were caused by the house being possessed by devils or haunted. Uh, Ron Sr. began putting religious statues and artifacts throughout the house and uh, throughout the property. And when asked why he had put up so many religious statues, he stated, because I have a devil on my back. In the spring of 73, Ron DeFeo Sr. went to a Catholic shrine in Toronto, Canada and summoned a Catholic priest and exorcist who came to the house and prayed prayers of exorcism. When the priest began to pray, paranormal activity began. Doors began slamming and candles that had been lit went out on their own. Ron Jr. was so terrified he left the house. According to the family housekeeper, Mrs. DeFeo repeatedly told her that she believed a terrible tragedy would happen to the family. Sadly, her fears came true when on November 14, 1974, Butch murdered the entire family in cold blood. As if that in and of itself isn't horrific enough, the details of the murders baffled investigators and still make no sense even to this day. While everyone else was asleep in bed, Butch took a 35 caliber Marlin rifle and systematically went throughout the house shooting each family member as they slept. Even stranger still, each family member was laying in the same position face down in bed and none of the family members seemed to hear the gunshots as Butch went throughout the house firing the rifle. No one responded, no one got up, no one rolled over, no one woke up. Toxicology tests done during the autopsies on the family members all showed that none of them had been drugged. There were no sedatives in any of their systems. So there was no explanation for how none of them could have not been awakened by the gunshots. Later in acoustic studies, investigators found that a 35 Marlin rifle fired indoors could still be heard nearly a mile away. But not only had none of the family members heard the shots uh, when the others were murdered, none of the neighbors heard any gunshots either. Some did hear the family dog barking, but no one heard the gunshots. Later, after he had confessed to the murders, Butch stated that once he started firing, he could not stop. Even stranger still, he also stated that before the murders, he had been downstairs watching a movie when a hooded figure appeared to him, handed him the rifle, and told him to kill his family. Butch was convicted of all six murders and was given six life sentences. Butch died in prison on March 12, 2021 at the age of 69 years old. On December 18, 1975, the Lutz family moved into the house. The Lutz family was made up of parents George and Kathy and children Daniel, Missy, and Christopher. I should also mention the family dog, Harry, because he did play a vital role in the story. The family was made aware of the murders but the house was sold at a very good price in those times, which was $85,000. After moving in at the suggestion of a friend, George had a Catholic priest known as Father Ray bless the house. After blessing the house, Father Ray told the Lutz family not to spend much time in the sewing room because he felt uncomfortable there. 
Father Ray later admitted that while he was blessing the sewing room, he felt a slap across his face and heard a voice say, get out. The longer the family was in the house, they began to notice more paranormal activity. Strange noises began being heard, such as scraping sounds and banging. The whole family begins having terrifying experiences. Kathy then found a hidden room in the basement. The room was painted a strange color of red and smelled really bad. The family dog, Harry, would not go near the room. George then began waking up at exactly 3.15 a.m., which coincided with the time of the DeFeo murders. George would then begin hearing a marching band in the middle of the night playing downstairs, and when he would go downstairs to investigate, he would find that all the floor rugs had been rolled up and all the furniture had been moved to the corners of the room. Even stranger yet, Kathy began having recurring dreams of the murders that had happened in the house, and the dreams were very vivid. Her dreams even showed where the bullets had entered the bodies of the victims and in what order they had been shot. The dreams described exactly what the police reports later showed. Missy then began speaking of an imaginary friend named Jody. She said he was an angel. He, she said he was a pig who could be big or small, invisible or visible. The family members then began seeing Jody. He had red eyes. He would rock in a rocking chair in her room and they found hoof prints in the snow outside the house. The family then began experiencing strange, inexplicable smells and banging doors. George and Kathy decided to try to rid the house of the evil spirits by going throughout the house reciting the Lord's Prayer when both of them heard a chorus of voices say, Will you stop? Later at night, both George and Kathy levitated out of their bed. They attempted to call Father Ray for help once again, but each time the calls would be disconnected. Father Ray also later stated that when he would be in his chancellor's office discussing helping the Lutz family with their house, the chancellor's office would become inexplicably cold. The Lutz family again attempted to bless the house, but the paranormal activity increased so drastically that the entire family was terrorized to the point that the next day, January 14, 1976, just 28 days after moving into the house, the family fled. The only belongings they took with them was one photo album. Later, all of the belongings that were left behind were auctioned off. The family never returned to the home. Later, when a team of investigators, including the famous Ed and Lorraine Warren, were brought in to investigate the house, George Lutz would not meet with them in the house. When he met with Ed Warren, he met at a pizza shop and refused to return to the house. The Lutz family claimed that the haunting followed them for years, even after moving to California to get as far away from Amityville as they could get. They also did admit that George and Kathy were practicing transcendental meditation while living in a house, which only made the situation worse. Later, when Ed and Lorraine Warren conducted an investigation of the house, a whole crew came with them, including cameramen, and the activity continued during the investigation. At one point, one of the cameramen began having major heart palpitations, and a researcher from Duke University had his chair move by itself. 
After spending some time in the house, Lorraine Warren claimed that house was as close to hell as she ever wants to get. Pictures were taken throughout the house using infrared film and one picture in particular showed what appears to be a child peeking out of one of the upstairs bedrooms, but there was no child in the house. Ed Warren correctly identified what is depicted in the picture, not as a ghost of a child, but as a devil or a demon. And as you can see, the image in the picture does have glowing eyes. So what can we learn from the Amityville Horror? Well, there's several things. Number one, I believe every haunting starts when someone opens a door. In this case, it could have been many centuries earlier when the Indians, who were also pagan, they were not Christian people, they were pagans, and they buried their enemies who they believed were demon-possessed on that property face down and then catch them coming to the area from Salem, Massachusetts and practicing witchcraft. That definitely created a whole nother set of problems because doors would have been opened even though the house wasn't there yet. Doors would be opened through his activity. Later when the house would be built or moved to that location in 1925 the activity that had already started on the ground will migrate right into the house. Whoever lives in that house will have problems. Another thing we can learn from the Amityville Horror House is, you know, with the DeFeo family, there were, there were a lot of bad dynamics going on in that family. You had Butch with the heavy drug use, drinking a lot of alcohol, Ron Sr., you know, with his violent outbursts and the way he treated his family. But also, you know, you can't get deliverance by putting up relics. You can't get deliverance by bringing in a priest to pray a so-called deliverance prayer or a ritual. That's not going to work. Furthermore, when Father Ray came into the house and the thing slapped him across the face and said, get out, that clearly showed that it was not afraid of the Catholics. It was not afraid of someone following a religion that does not believe that you must be born again in Jesus' name. If you, if you follow a religion that does not follow the teachings of Christ, including that you know you must be born again and repent of your sins you repent to god you re you do not repent to a priest if you want to confess to a priest to get something off your chest that's cool i don't have a problem with that but you're not going to be forgiven of your sins by confessing to him that needs to happen between an individual and god furthermore a person who prays to mary is not going to have authority whether they believe it or not you're not going to have authority to drive out a demon in jesus name because you already have an open door because you're praying to another demon that is masquerading as the virgin mary mary had children after she had jesus her and joseph had children together after that when they're talking about the virgin mary it is not jesus's mother whether they think it is or not. Furthermore, if you look at Catholic statues, you'll see lots of statues of Mary where Mary's trampling on the serpent's head as if Mary defeated Satan. And that is not the case. Only Jesus did. And we don't have a co-mediator in Mary. We have one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. So if you follow those false teachings and false beliefs, you will have no authority over demonic spirits. Absolutely none. So that's another thing we can learn um, from the Amityville Horror. Uh, not only that, the practicing of transcendental meditation 
by the Lutz family, George and Kathy. That opens up doors to demons. The power to do that comes through demonic power, straight from demons. There's famous movie series out where it's all about transcendental meditation. I believe it's Insidious is the name of it. Um, it's all about this demonic practice and it is opening doors to Satan. If people mess with that stuff, you will get demons. So that was a big problem. And George and Kathy, although George had once been Methodist, you know, once he converted to Catholicism, again, there's not really any power. There's no power there to get rid of this stuff. So, again, calling in the priest is not going to help. You know, the priest is going to get slapped and told to get out. It's not really going to help. Um, I believe there would have had to have been a very substantial exorcism on that house and property and a lot of renouncing of a lot of evil that had occurred there which we don't even know how deep that went. You know, there's rumors that the DeFeo family, Ronald Jr. or Butch, and his sister also dabbled in the occult in that house. So there's the possibility of that. But then when you have six murders, when you have six murders in the house, you're going to have problems. Doors are wide open to demons. So... The Lutz family moved into a bad situation and opened up more doors. Another thing we can learn from the Amityville Horror, you know, I think Ed and Lorraine Warren did a lot of good. I think they had good, they were good hearted people. They were trying to do what was right. But again, uh, following a lot of the Catholic principles and the uh, Catholic practices is not going to bring victory and it's not going to bring deliverance. Furthermore, it was stated that during their investigation, there was a seance conducted. So if you practice seances and you engage in seances, uh, you're opening more doors. I believe that's why they didn't have success as far as cleansing the house and getting rid of the demons. But that is something you should never do. Seances automatically open doors to Satan and they are of the occult. So that should have never been done either. It's no surprise that they got the picture of the demonic uh, child uh, on infrared film uh, with glowing eyes. It's no surprise, number one, because of all the terrible things that had happened there. And then also they were not helping the situation by having a seance. Another thing that was interesting, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's the, that's the ghost of one of the, the uh, DeFeo children who was killed. It's not. No, it is not. Um, demons appear as children in a lot of haunting situations. And the other thing they like to do is, you know, when that child was murdered, when those DeFeo boys were murdered in that house, demons got legal rights to be there even more than what they already were. What they already had been given as far as legal rights, now they had even more because of those murders. Demons are often very arrogant and they will go around mimicking what gave them their legal right to be there. So it's no surprise that when a child is murdered in the house that a demon will appear as that child. Into 25th Street. I had a vision uh, one night after my bed moved inexplicably by itself and uh, when I tried to go to sleep I had a vision that I was standing outside the bedroom door looking down the staircase and there was what appeared to be a dead man, an older man, who was, he looked like he was dead, and he was in a hooded cloak, so it was a hooded figure, like floating up my stairs, just coming up the staircase towards my bedroom. And it turned out that, now when that happened, I knew nothing about the history of the house, nothing whatsoever. But uh, I renounced it in Jesus' name and bound it in Jesus' name and the vision stopped. But I later found out that there had been a suicide in the house in 1958. And what I saw in that vision, 
that appeared as a hooded figure looked like the individual who committed suicide in the house in 1958. Even stranger, the suicide was March 1st, 1958. And by all my calculations and my notes and my way of tracking down what day that happened, I tried to be as thorough as I could. And uh, the incident where I had the vision occurred on March 1st, 2010. So again, demons like to replay the events that gave them a legal right to be there. So, although the Amityville Horror is a fascinating story, I think we can look at it and learn from it and learn, you know, let's apply biblical principles to the situation. And, you know, if we come across a haunting or a person who needs spiritual help, let's apply biblical principles, not rituals, not Roman Catholicism, you know, not transcendental meditation or anything like that of the occult, but apply biblical principles um, in Jesus name and cast out what is there in Jesus name. Yes, you may have to get rid of items in the house that could be cursed items or charged items, however you want to say that. If there's items that are cursed, you want to get rid of them. Um, but beyond that, it comes down to dealing with the legal rights and casting out what is there in Jesus name. So I hope the broadcast tonight, uh, you know, gave you a little bit of insight on one of the most notorious hauntings that has happened in America and also how should a Christian deal with a situation like that so they can come out victorious. I have personally owned two houses that were very infested with demons. Uh, by God's grace, I survived both of them and shared my stories to help others. Those are the stories that are in my books 225th Street and Nightmare in Holmes County. And I have a, a forthcoming book titled Shadows and Light, which I will share more stories of hauntings and deliverance. But I hope that kind of uh, gives you some insight on how to deal with this and how to apply biblical principles. So I want to thank you again for tuning into the podcast tonight. Again, I'm your host, Patrick Meekin, and I'm the author of the book's Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street, which tell terrifying true stories of spiritual warfare and paranormal activity and deliverance in real life haunted houses. Both books are available from Crown of Thorns Publishing at Amazon.com. Until next week, good night and God bless.